Mill Serp Garage back with a Marlin. That's right, the Marlin Model 38. This is an obscure one. You're hard pressed to even find a picture of this one online. Um, but that does not indicate that it wasn't, uh, you know, that it doesn't deserve a spot on the hall of fame for these uh these 22s that from around this period this thing is monumental they were a lot of huge design improvements going on here or just basically this thing it's one of my favorite designs and it's not a john browning design so that says a lot i'm a john browning fanboy over here and this guy Carl Gustav Swibelius. That name might sound familiar, but it probably won't. Uh, most people that have ever heard the name Swibelius, with, when it comes to Marlins, had to do with a site. He designed like a certain kind of site that he patented that was hugely popular. So I think this site was used across the line on all different rifles, not just twenty twos. You know, so I think that's why. Just normal gun people might have might have heard that because every once in a blue moon, that's the only time I really stumble across the guy's name, is if I'm looking on Gun Broker and there's a, a gun and it says, you know, it's giving the breakdown of what it has as far as options and it says Swabelius site, and a lot of people might even think that's all he was known for was this site. Uh uh, this dude was a firearms designing genius, basically a precision machinery genius. Let me give you a little background before we even move into the gun. Let me just throw this down with this guy Swabelius so we're just on the same page here, you know, because um, we're going to get into like some of the design stuff that I show you on here. And it would make me feel really comfortable knowing that you just at least have some information on this guy. Carl Gustav Swabelius was born in 1879 in Sweden. And he worked with his dad, who must have had some type of machinery, a machine shop or something, because he was like a he was like a genius with precision machinery, even as a child. And uh, he came to the U.S. right around the turn of the century, right around 1900. Got a job at Marlin making barrels. This guy was a barrel maker. And he might have even designed some of the machinery, like patented some of the machinery used to make barrels the way he liked to make them, you know. And um, he made foreman of the barrel making area, promoted to the tool room in only a couple of years, then promoted to gun design in only a few years. So this guy like moved up the chain really quick. And it's when he was with gun design that he created this thing. And uh, this... This, this him making this design actually was only around. See, it's a model thirty two. You on model thirty eight, you would think, okay, uh, it was made in nineteen thirty eight. These didn't go that way. Like with Marlin, um, at least in this case, that's not what was going on here because this is way earlier. The original patents for this gun were let me see, I got it written down were nineteen thirteen. So his original moving into the gun designing area. And um, so he came to came to the U.S. in 1900 uh, as a uh, 20-something-year-old guy, you know, like, or whatever. And around there, 18, 20 years old, got a job at Marlin. And by, 19, by 1913, this guy is designing guns and, and has something on the, uh, you know, on the table that he's actually designing. That's a, that shows that this guy was really a, uh, you know, a, a gifted uh, designer and a machinist so what happened was this was originally back it seemed like i was writing everything down in order but now i'm jumping around um the original patents for this were in 1913 and this was a big deal so you're looking at this thing this look you like what's the big deal with it you know it doesn't look any special to me everything had a hammer back then so around around when you know the around 19 13 having a hammerless rifle not having a hammer back here was actually a big thing everything had a hammer think about it look at everything that was like right before it you know what i mean having hammerless this was in vogue this was the big thing every manufacturer had to 
be able to put something down and go, this is our hammerless design, you know what I mean? So you look at that when we looked at, I know we had a Savage out here, the 1914, that was a big deal that that thing didn't have a hammer, you know, and, and, uh, but Marlin, they were kind of like late to catch up to this, you know what I mean? That you saw like even the 20A that we did the feature on the, the 22 had, had, it was not hammerless, it had a hammer. So moving to this, you see some of their first designs were interesting. They kind of looked like the 20 with just metal covering this area. You know, it's almost like you just enclosed this spot with a hammer underneath, you know. So it looked kind of funny. It still had, you know how, see how the Marlins, they have like a... Let me see if I can get an idea of what I'm talking about. This was the first prototype right here. And this was the, um, this was the 1913... The original prototype and it was uh it was rejected it was basically if you look at it it just looks kind of like the 20a it still came apart like this it's still the takedown was still clamshelled kind of like half the gun it would like split the gun in half down the receiver like you like it was just split like that and the bolt if you remember you know most of those marlin bolts they kind of let me go back and see if i could find what i'm talking about picture of what the bolts look like it's just kind of like this where the bolt is kind of like just receiver the receiver metal and the whole thing slides back do you understand what i'm saying like you look at the 20a video you'll see what i'm talking about i just can't find a close-up of a i can't find a close-up of a receiver to show you what i'm talking about but basically like this area here is just metal that when you when you pull the pump back, that metal slides back to reveal the loading port. Whereas now with this new design, it had that look to it, which is more like a modern gun where, you know, it has just a port. And instead of the metal here all sliding back, it was just a hole, you know, where like when you, when you opened up, when you opened up the, uh, when you slid the action back, that would disappear into the receiver and it wouldn't because it used to have to all slide back here to push a hammer back but now that was all compartmentalized into here so this is this this modern type of ejection port right here this to them back then was modern this design introduced this like to marlin you know what i mean so it's really tough to look at it now and understand how something like that could have been like moving forward, but it, but it really was. And um, while well, I got the book out, this is that site, that's Swabilia's site. And uh, these here are the patents for the, the newer one. Now, when I say newer one, an older one, I'll explain. Not only was there originally a prototype, which the internals here are what was in that prototype. We're going to look at the internals soon. Um, but the outside came apart. The takedown was still that clamshell that split the receiver where two halves came apart like that. Like the 20A that I just did the video on. It had that, like I said, the metal sliding back here instead of it just being a port. And uh, But the internals were carried over. And this was all enclosed, and this and all the all the more modern stuff to them, and that was called the Model Thirty Two. That came out in nineteen fifteen. The patents for that were from nineteen fourteen and nineteen fifteen, and uh, it had the side ejection port, the new takedown configuration, the Swabilia sight on it, and something that they called a sear release, which is really interesting because now, in order to release the pump when you're locked up like this like let's say here you close it you're locked now right you used to be able to pull the trigger and lower the hammer down slowly with your finger number one that would that would open this where it would be able to move again or you'd be able to just with your finger because mostly it was the firing pin that would you know lock it up that that would be the what would unlock it is the firing pin being hit you could push the firing pin gently with your thumb it would be right there and then you would, it would be unlocked. That was another way to do it. But now, you don't have access anymore to anything in here. Your finger, your thumb, your finger, you can't move anything. If you pull the trigger, the hammer's going to fall. You can't stop it with your finger. So they needed something. They called it, we usually call that like, you know, a, uh, a um, an action release button or something like that. They called it a sear release, 
which is interesting. I think that's the coolest name possible for, you know, the first thing you do when you pick up a gun at a gun show or whatever and it's locked up is you go, okay, how do I release the action? So you call it like an action release button or something like that, but sear release. How cool is that? So you, this is where he put it underneath here. So you would press it to be able to have access to release it to either cycle around out or whatever you were doing. That's obviously new because before then you always had access to the hammer. You had access to your sear just by holding the hammer and pulling the trigger. You had control over what was going on over here where you don't anymore. You only had control to either release it for where it falls or that it wasn't even charged at all. And if you pulled the trigger, it did nothing. That was the only thing that you could do. You had no control. So anyway, that was new. And uh, it was introduced in 1915. But by 1916, Marlin was called on to start making arms for World War I. They were making machine guns and everything like that. So that was the end of this gun. With all those pivot, all these pivotal designs and all that awesomeness. It was only out for a very short time. And let me tell you, the public loved it. Like, these are like these advertising stuff that they have here like this. We're going to look at this later. Look, they have, they even showing, they're showing like customers, like what the bolt looks like and how pivotal this is. We're going to look at this. This is, this thing is awesome. How it comes apart. See how it doesn't come apart like this anymore. It was a big deal that it came apart like this and how it came apart. And the sight, his sight, this was known as. The new hammerless repeater. It's like, look at how modern and awesome we are. So let's delve a little bit. Let me see what else I have on this piece of paper. Oh, listen to that. I'm going to give you some stats from this guy, Suobelius, quick. Listen to this. When wartime happened and this gun went by the wayside, <laughs> this guy lightened the brown. This is during wartime. He was this World War One or World War Two? Hold on. No, you know what? This is World War Two. This is how long this guy carried on. This guy was around even during World War Two period. He lightened the Browning machine gun, the Browning thirty caliber machine gun, from thirty five to nineteen pounds, so they'd be able to put it on planes. No, I think this was in World War One. I'm sorry. From thirty five to nineteen pounds, so it could go on planes. And this is the guy, oh, and he also uh, raised the rate of fire from 400 to 900 rounds per minute. So he almost doubled, more than doubled the um, rate of fire. This is working alongside Browning doing this, okay? So, man, if I was the guy in the shop working with Browning to get all of this done, but he was credited with these. It wasn't like Browning took credit for this. He was credited with getting these things done. Um, he also perfected a cam system to shoot guns through propellers. So it doesn't say he invented it, but he perfected it, where you could mount a gun, a machine gun on the front of a plane and fire through the propeller without hitting the propeller. I know you've seen that and you've wondered how the hell that happens. It's a camming system off the propeller that only allows when it's between the blades to fire, and then when the blade comes, the cam shuts the machine gun off. So to the machine gun, it feels like it's firing steady. It is, it's firing steady, but it's at the perfect time so the bullets go right through the propeller. He's the guy that perfected that. And then after the war, he was the chief designer at Marlin and then at Winchester till 1939. And listen, this is like some weird history. I'm going to just touch on this quickly and then we're going to move into this gun. He bought Hartford Arms in 1932 with a few partners. And they made these things called high standard pistols. I don't know if you've ever heard of these things. They're 22 semi-automatic pistols. And in World War II, there was this whole big thing. You could look into this and read about it. It's fascinating. I was like reading it for hours. He, um, he sold these 22s. They were bought up by the government in mass. The government was just like, we want everything you could produce, all of them. I think they're hard to find actually because of this. They were silenced 22 handguns they took them they said they wanted them for training purposes right these things and then they were like all right we 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 don't want them as that long you have to shorten them and it, it was it was obviously they were being used for clandestine operations 
Um, they were a silence 22, and the problem was that um, since 22 ammo wasn't jacketed, the ammo did not, it, it, it didn't, um, wasn't good for the Hague Convention, which was a agreement that all the nations had for how ammo would be or what weapons can be used or so because 22 ammo wasn't jacketed it wasn't really sanctioned to be used so the government had to be clandestine about using these things you know what i mean but they were obviously used by they were bought up by what is that like oss and everything like that that's who bought those things and they said they were using them for training purposes man those things were assassinating people that's what those things were doing and that was his company that produced those guns. Whatever. So this guy's influence went way through, all through World War I, all through World War II. This guy didn't die until like the late 40s, you know? How the hell gun people aren't like, this guy's name should be like right at the forefront. Now, there can be people that study this stuff and they're like, of course, it, it is. I know the guy, but you know what? I don't really hear his name all that often to you. Well, anyway... Let's get into this gun. So now we go way back to like the first thing he designed after coming to this country for Marlin as a, you know, 20 something year old guy that made it all the way up to, or maybe almost like 30 years old, made it all the way up to being Marlin's chief designer or, you know, in the, there's not a chief designer, but in the firearms department after World War One he was, but before he made it all the way up to being able to design guns pretty quickly and came up with this. So the Model 32 that was discontinued when they went into World War I production, after World War I, they came back again and started making it again. But that little hitch in it kind of made it like, I don't know, it's it's weird. You know, when something like that happens to the production of something, it could definitely affect its, its impact, you know? It kind of like took the wind out of its sails that there was that period of its of it disappearing that when it came back it wasn't so 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 new anymore and you know it was, just, it was odd but um let's move into this guy this guy now let me where's see this is the one thing i forgot to have out is the information on mine specifically here we go mine is a 1926 manufacturer so they made this thing from 1921 to 1930 and um, that's obviously the Model 38, because if they started in 21, so, so that was like right after the war, you know what I mean? So the, if you really wanted to be honest about its production, it, there was really no changes between the 20, the 32 and the 38. So the 32, the first year of production was like 1915, and then it was just kind of not produced until 1921, and then they made it until 1930. <laughs> So, uh, but I, for my, for the sake, since it says model 38 on it and the other one said model 32, I guess we can consider it a different model. So 21 to 30, not really a long lifespan, nine years, not really a long lifespan for something that was like so pivotal, you know? So, uh, this one's all numbers matching, which was cool. Uh, what else do we have here? Blah, blah. Uh, 15 shorts, 12 longs, 10 long rifles. That's what's fitting it. And that's that. Those take all three. So 1926. That's the vintage we're looking at here. So no, oops, no octagon uh, barrel. We have a round barrel here. And um, no Swabilia sight. We just have Marlin's regular sight on here. The older ones probably, you know, a 32 are the ones produced right when they came back might have that but not by 1926 so let's break this thing down a little bit uh we have a uh single operating rod we have a this is a little confusing back here this is messes everybody up um this might look like a the typical safety you'd have on a shotgun that you use with your thumb this isn't a safety. This is actually the takedown lever. This button right here is the safety. I'm going to show you how cool the safety is, actually. This safety, when it's in the off position, let me rotate the gun around this way and bring it up a little bit. When the safety's in the off position, 
you don't even see it here. See, look, it just conforms to the trigger guard. It just follows the curve of the trigger guard. So your hand, I'm going to move this finger so you can see. This is how your hand would sit on the rifle. This finger just sits right inside there, and you don't even know anything's there. Now, you want to put the safety on. The button's right here. You press it, and you see what it does. It This extends. This is how genius this guy was. He was pretty, this guy was pretty good. It extends out now. So now, if you go to fire, the worst thing, you'd never pull the trigger to go fire a gun when the safety's on. That you wouldn't, that's not what really, the safety is for when you don't want it to fire inadvertently. If you're actually grabbing the gun and pulling the trigger, you obviously want to shoot it. So um, that's why safety's like this, where when you're in the act of actually shooting, it shuts off. Kind of like a Glock. You know, a Glock has that little tab inside the trigger. That little tab inside the trigger, if you try to grab the edges of the trigger and pull it like this or something like that, or something just pushes the back of it, it won't it won't move. But obviously, if you put your finger in and you touch that button and you pull the trigger, it'll shoot. That's uh, So Glock actually does have, a lot of people say it doesn't have a safety. It does have a safety. That is technically like a safety. And um, the re it'll always fire when you put your finger in the trigger and pull, because when you put your finger on the trigger and pull, you want it to fire no, no matter what. So here's the thing. I think I spit on it. Um, so this right here will automatically shut off when you grab the gun to shoot. And that's pretty cool. It's kind of like a big button safety on like a Remington 870 shotgun. The big button safety is like on the side right here. And when you put your finger in the trigger to shoot, it, it automatically clicks it off. So that's the safety. This is the takedown. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Now this sear release thing, look at the odd position that that's in, right? You think that's kind of weird. Like it would get in the way in the trigger guard or get inadvertently pressed. No, it never does. It never gets inadvertently pressed. Your finger always sits right here on the trigger. It's just various states of pulling, pulling. You don't like actually pull the trigger like this. You know, you're just putting pressure on, pressure, pressure to shoot. And it's really cool that it's right here because normally with a lot of these other 22s or any other guns for that matter, you would have to leave the trigger guard and press something that's here or press something that's here or press something that's here. What's cool about this one is it's locked right now. And if I want to unlock it, it's my finger doesn't really have to do much to, as far as coming away from its spot that where it lives. Your finger should live right here. So that's all it takes. You don't have to press that all the way in either. You just lean on it. It's pretty cool. It's definitely a good, a good idea to put it right in here. Never saw that before on any other gun. Now, as far as the takedown feature dig this we've looked at all these takedowns let me show you how simple this one is well actually this is an easier orientation we've seen a bunch of these right this is the, by far the easiest one you pull this down and that releases like that it's kind of like the same motion that like a break action shotgun uses when you open it that way it's kind of like that same angle you could see the hinge right here. It hooks right into this pin right here. And putting it back together is just as simple. You just hook that in there, and boom, like that's how simple it is. It comes apart that easy. It goes back together that simple. How awesome is that? And there's a, like a button here that has a screw on, I'm sure that screw has something to do with adjusting it, so you could adjust it to be perfect to click in. I wasn't messing with it. And uh, you could see here, the patents are all there for the sear release button and how it, how it makes everything in here move. And that connects underneath here. Another thing cool about this guy, let's zoom in a little bit now. Another thing cool about this is the ease of bolt removal. The bolt, comes out that easy and then not only that i'm not going to do it because it's a real pain in the neck let me unzoom for just a minute this the forearm comes right off of here you see the button we're going to get to the magazine i didn't do the magazine um, yet but the forearm pushes the magazine release button in you see that and this will slide over it will slide over and all the way off so you get the action bar and the forearm come right off and then 
All you do is depress this button again and slide it back on and it goes right back on. So that's how easy it is to, to, to take it down, even taking the floor end off. And uh, the bolt. Well, let's show you how... Well, instead of showing you how easy it goes back in, let's, uh, let's do some bolt examination here. Let me zoom in. I'm sorry if I'm uh, breathing heavy, but it's... It's hard. It's hard not to breathe heavy. Let me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to put a napkin here so I know exactly where my camera is. Then I'm going to sit down here so I can get a little closer. This bolt is so awesome to look at the design here and watch what this thing does. This bolt has these notches in it that cam along recesses inside the receiver. It's almost like a valve body and an automatic transmission. You see, like, you gotta, re you gotta think of, as a firearms designer, what do you have to power your gun? The motion of a person pulling back and forth is just horizontal movement, back and forth. That's it, that's all you have to do everything, so, some things might have to be lifted up. Some things might have to be twisted. So how do you do that if all you have is back and forth motion? By using camming action. So there's, you see this right here, what's going on? This is where the round would sit. Let's say the, um, the follower in the magazine pushes the round right into here like this, right? So it's... So it's sitting like this. And then this motion of pulling this up raises that, wait, raises that up and would push it, eventually it would go to do it by hand because I don't really have the power here. Oh, no, it's spring-loaded. It would have gone. This is, the end of it is spring-loaded see that is this getting on film here oh this is awesome it's such tight work i wish i had like the cameras to be able to uh really get close and look but uh and then there's your firing pin here now an issue i had with this gun when i first got it is that the uh the firing pin here is a like full floating firing pin so you should really you should be able to hear that when you take the bolt out, it, was, it wasn't it was doing that. It was locking up. Look, it's still a little sticky. If I push it forward, see how it sticks a little? It still needs a little of attention. When you're sanding something, like when you're using like sandpaper to sand off burrs and things on firing pins and stuff like that, it's better to do too little than too much. So after fitting everything all back together, again, I can see it needs a teeny bit more. But um, without that, with that firing pin stuck forward like that, it was the problem I was having, that even closing the bolt could set off the round or that the lifter wouldn't be able to lift the round up properly it would actually get stuck just like that and that's where no matter how hard I push the bolt back I didn't slam on it but that's as high as we go meanwhile if the firing pin was released you see it would allow it to push it up and eventually I don't have the finger strength to do it for it's not really supposed to be done that way but to push it up into there now it's captured see so it's like stuck in there it's two extractors here see it and um, so that up and down motion is this nub right here caught inside in here you see it's like a I don't know if you're able to see what's going on in there but it's like a it's almost like a valve body let's <laughs> see it, it has that makes me it reminds me of that so that's where all that up and down motion comes from these diagonal cuts in here that make, you know, as the, as the bolt translates horizontally, there's cuts inside the receiver that lift these pieces up and down. There's a couple of them. There's another one here, and this is for the locking lug. See, that's the locking lug. If you notice, this bolt didn't tilt. It didn't tilt to lock into anything like this. Like when it comes up, it has a camming motion here to this guy that pushes this lug that you see right there 
into that hole that's in the top of the receiver. That's the locking lug. This is totally different than John Browning's designs. Like, there isn't one single thing here that carries through. It's so unique. You know, this guy was... That's why I say it's like... It's one of my favorites just because of the... Uh, how I could see how he's literally harnessing the horizontal movement and doing what he needs to do with it. Now to put this back together, it sits kind of like right there. And you see, that's what you want is that lug right there going into that slot on the action rod, the operating rod, action bar. Or whatever you want to call it. There you go. I think all of those would be good. And then uh, it makes it past that point. And then, boom. See, now here you can see that actually sliding up and down. You see that right there? That's what I'm talking about. That's the lifter right there. And you know what you can even do at this point? Check this out. Let's close the action here. Let's open the magazine tube. This is a, a different magazine tube than we're used to, too. I'm going to show you. I forgot, but I want to I wanna make sure I get that. Let's see where I am on camera. Good. Check this out. When you open the action, there it is. See? It comes out of the magazine tube and gets lifted right up into place. All in one shot. Did you see that? And then there it is, ready to be fed. Oops. <laughs> It, uh, it wasn't all the way back. I was thinking I was going to push it back against, like, the stop, the hammer, but there is no hammer. Without the hammer there, it kind of makes it operate a little odd. But, but there you go, and then sends it home, and then the ejector right there sends it across my shop. Really powerful ejector here. I originally thought, let's do that again. Let me load it charge it all right and close it now which uh, where should we look at it from let's just i guess we'll just watch it from right here here it comes it gets lifted up into position see usually it's going back against it's got to be careful you have to overcome some resistance there it goes I have to overcome that and usually it would be pushing the hammer back right now and then there's a stop up like a bolt stop the bolt stop had to be my thumb this time. And then uh, close. Bang. And then. Boom. There's the eject. Now the ejector. i got to show you this in the book. This was another one of his patents. There's a whole bunch of patents for this guy. Where is it? That is the patent. Oh, now I don't see it. Was it in this book? Maybe it was in another book. 29, 32. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I'm talking about, how the bolts used to look. See that? They used to be like a whole thing that would slide out like of the receiver, kind of like Hellraiser box kind of thing. But uh, I can't find... Uh, I can't find the picture of that. Give me a second. Maybe it's in here. Nope. I don't know where that picture is. There's a picture of that. Oh, here it is. Sorry. All right. It was worth it. It was worth the wait. Here it is right here. This configuration right here might be the only thing that changed between the 32 and the 38. That's actually right where the round is getting caught to eject, it's kind of like, you know, getting caught right on the edge of that. But ding, that's what's sending it out. But look at what's behind it to make all of that work. This one plays on that one. See those two little tabs right there that meet? I thought those weren't meeting right. And I took these two little screws out and took all of this apart, <laughs> thinking I was going to fix what was wrong when the firing pin was sticking. But meanwhile... That didn't do anything. 
except make me realize it was incorrectly. It was in correctly I'm saying not incorrect but it was it was correct and I was there those pieces are right in there and boy let me tell you getting them back in again not pretty can we see well, there well there are those pieces in there there's the that's way too bright there's the one ejector right there and you can see how those pieces are together all along the hole underneath maybe like that well trust me when I tell you <clears throat> unless they're broken don't take those apart if you have one of these okay so the bolt let's put the bolt back in again I'll show you that again see that lug right there that goes right into that lug right there and then make sure that the locking lug is out of the way and it will close there we go and again to relock it that easy boom nice now the magazine tube this magazine tube we saw it on the 20a this is actually a modification of the type of magazines where you push the rounds in the side of the gun. It has more in common with that kind of magazine than it does in the regular tube magazines where you remove the whole magazine out and it has a little follower tip and it's a tube by itself. Nothing comes out of this gun. It just slides in its housing out to here and locks in, locks open and stays on there. And then you load rounds through that tube and then when you're done, you release it, and it charges those rounds. Let's do that, actually. Let's get some in there. You have to be careful, because it will snap shut, and that's not good. The only problem with this design was that there's some kind of, like, the connection where it's by the receiver for this tube. And this is all steel, by the way, so, you know, you got to keep it oiled, you got to keep it dry, blah, 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 all of that, but... It's still a great design. I don't want to get that nonsense. Well, like, well, it's not brass. It could rust. It's like, what are you doing? Using the thing as an ore? I mean, you know, keep it dry, keep it clean, keep it oiled, and you're good. We'll just put a few in there. So you see it. You don't have to worry about that pushing it over the rounds thing. It sits on top of the rounds here. Now that it's already charged. This could be loose, see? Because it's inside, it's already sitting there. The spring pressure, as long as you release it. See, when it's locked... Then, no, there's no, these rounds can now just slide around in here. When it snaps shut like that, it's already being pressurized now. Now, this is just the slack taken up. So you don't have to worry about sliding over rounds. That's why he invented that like this, see? Now, it's you're, all you're doing, the tube is just sliding over the tube, not over the rounds. Hard to explain, but trust me, it's much better because now you don't have to push the tube. They don't have to fit into the magazine as you push the tube closed, which is definitely a problem with most of these. And um, this is the older type. They call it the, I don't know, the, the lever. Hold on. It's two types of latches. Here they are. There's the, they call it the, all right, this is a button type and just the earlier type. So they don't really have a type for this. It's just called the latch type, earlier latch type button. Sorry, I was blocking the light. And then the newer type was a button like this. Now, why was the button better? It couldn't slap shut on you. So this one, when you open this and you're loading, it could it could go, you could just come off the latch and just slide shut, bang, really hard. And then... It breaks down and it could break down in here where it connects. So you have to be careful. You have to be gentle with it. That's why they improved it to a button. The button fits into a recess. So when you open this, there would be a recess and the, the ball would fit inside that recess. So it couldn't slap shut until you actually pressed the button. So it was much better. I've seen those and I've played with them at gun shows and they definitely seem to work better. Now, as far as the action, check this out. You could zoom in a little and watch how this thing functions. It's so cool. So where are here we go? Is this enough light? I think that's enough light. So when we open, 
There it goes. See, it just gets lifted up into place almost by magic. That's camming motion. So you're using back and forth camming motion to a back and forth motion to cam something into up and down motion. Back all the way. See, it wasn't back all the way. That sets the hammer and puts it in the right spot. It wouldn't let it go forward unless it was in the right spot, which was cool. So you don't sit there struggling with it. You just go, oh, it won't go forward. means it's not ready. Got to go back more. And now, as we're ejecting, watch what happens. It's almost simultaneous. Rejecting and lifting the next round up into place. See that? And closed. And bang. And we're opening, rejecting, lifting round up, and close. I'm proud of this because the firing pin being jammed up was getting in the way of this, and I could not, I could not diagnose that. I just couldn't get it. And having to make this video, having to make this video made me realize I have to finally fix this gun to be able to do a video because I wanted to do this with it. And that's it. We're empty. Now, what else did we have to do? Oh, uh, just, I don't know, one other thing you could... You don't have to dry fire this guy. You can open the bolt to right about there. Pull the trigger. Now the hammer, you release the sear, and the hammer is laying on the bolt. And you just let, I'm holding the uh, forend, and then you just let go of the forend, and it closes. I should have shown you that from back here so you could see the whole thing. Let's charge it first. So a lot of people would be like, well, how do I release the, how do I release it now? I, I can't put my hand on the hammer to release the tension, or so they wanted to make sure there was a way. And there's a position, you, you feel it, it's right there. You actually have to push to go the rest of the way but it easily opens to that spot. So that's the sweet spot where you pull the trigger and you could just let go of the forend and it'll close. So you did not have to dry fire it. You just kind of like rode the hammer down the bolt. Pretty cool, right? So what the hell did I forget? That's the question now, what did I forget? Well, this modern design right here, having an actual ejection port like that or whatever, this was, uh, this was like, wow, check that out. Look at how sleek and modern that looks. No rain can get in here. No dirt can get in here. This is all sealed. If, if I could just remember, you know, what the takedown. Oh, they changed this too, actually. Let me see if I can find you a picture of that. Look, this is the bolt broken down. Look, I read up on this, man. Trust me. This is this whole, this bolt that we were looking at all broken down. See what he put here? It says he patented this, but it wasn't used. It wasn't, you'd never, the gun wasn't around long enough to use it. But a lot of people were like, yo, I'm out here. I'm out here. I'm, I'm fine. I'm using the gun, right? And I just go to put it on safety. And, you know, so I, I flip the safety. I'm like, oh my, oh my, it just falls apart in my hands. What the hell? I didn't mean to do that. You know how many people did that? They went to put the safety on, and the guy, it just literally comes right apart the second you touch that button. So a lot of people were like, man, that needs to be protected somehow so I don't do that by mistake. So I remember it's the button and not this lever. So what they did was they made this. He patented this. And this was so that you had to press this button first, and then either with the other hand or, or with if you just could be crafty with your finger, I would assume you'd be able to do it. Look, it says patent right on here. You put the patent. You wrote the patent. But um, that would make it so that you'd have to press that button first and just having to slide that wouldn't make, it, uh, make the safety go on immediately because the breakdown of the trigger group. Trust me, it was, it was innovative for its time. This gun was very innovative. Um, Marlin was uh, Marlin was really happy with this uh, Swabilius guy. They stuck with this guy for quite a while. This guy was a very prolific designer for them. 
And what's really cool about this is historically, this was his first foray into making guns. I mean, his first patents were for the internals here that I just showed you, like how the bolt works kind of thing and everything. And then I guess Marlon was like, you know, we don't really like that first design was kind of like, like I said, it was like the case of the 20. He just like took like a model 20 and put his insides inside of it and just went from there. Cause that's what else do you know back then? You're like, it wasn't anything else. So he, they like the internals, but they're like, but we want hammerless where it's just, you know, let's see what you can do. Just make something from scratch. It's like, it's not translating well to this other design. This guy, this, this design, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't what they were looking for. It was this. It was this design here. There's a picture of it. That's just a prototype. They never made that. And uh, that's how the prototype came apart. Whoops, sorry. That's how it came apart. But look, the internals. Look at the bolt. That's the bolt we were just looking at. And look at how that hammer is inside. See, it's, it's not. I could see. I could see why Marlon would be like, that's not... It's interesting, but this isn't working. We need a whole new, see how it's angled back here? Like as if that's where the hammer used to be, you know? And Marlon was like, no, 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 just, just fit it into something new. Just start, start from scratch. We can't put new into old, you know, you're being held back kind of thing. He might've told them. I'm only, par I'm only thinking if I was sitting behind that big, beautiful wood desk, that's probably what I would be saying if I saw that is like, I like the new, but let's get rid of, let's just start new, start fresh. And this shape, this ejection port, it definitely worked. And that's the Marlin Model 38. There it is right there. And uh, try to find one of these, I dare you. But that's the Marlin Model 38. I'm glad we got to do this one. I, it's one of my favorites. And now, just to let you know, the next couple that we're going to cover are going to be... We're winding down. i got to be honest with you. You're waiting for me to say that I'm winding down. There's uh, there's a few left. Don't get me wrong. we got enough to, uh, enough to go for a while. But now we're moving into my favorites. I definitely saved my favorites for last. So we're going to see you soon. Uh, any questions on this guy or info? Info is always good. You see, I do a lot of reading and I have these books, but, but you know, there's always, um, there's always, uh, always more information. There's always more info, stuff to tie stuff together. You know what I'm saying? But if you're interested in this Swabilius guy, check it out. Like all this World War II, this clandestine silenced pistol nonsense and everything. Read, read about it. This guy was, he was involved, boy. And, um. And uh, from the 19, from this model 38 on, his uh, life in the gun world went, uh, it went deep. So that's it, everybody. Glad you tuned in. Thank you. Like, comment, subscribe, all of that, whatever the hell everyone's talking about. And um, let me know what you want to see next. It'd be really funny if, uh, you know, one of my favorites is one of your favorites, and I'll put it up front. Uh, next to go is uh next to go is going to be great actually i don't, I don't want to hear what you want to see actually you just just wait till you see what i'm going to show you i'm going to show you one of my favorites next time uh maybe if not my favorite i think i'm just going to throw my favorite down i'm gonna to have to and uh see you all later take care